Okay. Okay, good. Loud and clear. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me, and and sorry uh, about the uh, technicalities here. We had a bit of a, a bit of drama here this morning, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to be online or not. My mum and dad live right next door, and of course they're elderly. And my uh, my poor father took a little bit of a fall this morning and gashed his head pretty badly and uh, they had to take him to the hospital and I was going to cancel uh, but there's no point because you can't go to the hospitals right now because they're not letting anybody in except for perhaps my mother so um, if I have to take off all of a sudden then you'll you'll know why um, but it is a little bit worrying when you have elderly parents that uh, you know that that time in their lives when uh, things start to uh, to break down. Um, recently, photography wise, photography right now for me, and I and I and I gather for a lot of you, uh, this time of year is not terribly inspiring. Um, one of the problems that we've had in British Columbia, anyway, is that we've had. Uh, quite a lot of heat. It's been sunny and hot for the last several weeks, which is very unusual for this uh, this location. And also we've had a lot of wildfires, which I'm sure a lot of you have endured, um, and also wildfires all, all around the world and flooding and all kinds of uh, uh, things going on that aren't too great. Um, Oops, I think I just lost you. One of the things that um, on the island has not been great is is because of all the wildfires, um, a lot of people from central British Columbia and Alberta have been coming over to the island. Um, so pretty much everybody who's got on holiday in Canada has ended up on the island. So if you're thinking of coming to the island, you might want to think twice because there's actually nowhere to stay. Everything is booked up, including backcountry uh, campsites. So uh, it's probably not the best place to come to right now. And photography wise, it's not all that inspiring. Hence my lack of videos for the last couple of weeks. Um, let's just have a look here. Yeah, so I mean, everybody's kind of in the similar in a similar uh, situation. Okay, Adam, switch off the focus thingy. Um, what's the focus thingy? Oh, yes, good idea. Okay, hang on that. Oh, technology, I just love it. I've set up my um, my Fuji camera. Just one second there. I've set up my Fuji camera. And um, I've never really used it. So I've, I've just kind of set this up in the last 10, 15 minutes. So I apologize for that. Is that better? There we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. As you can tell, I you know I've been taking photographs for a long time now, but I'm not actually that techy. Um, when people ask me about camera gear, I'm I'm actually pretty used to it. <laughs> I just turn the thing on and uh, start taking photographs. Most of the time, I just put my camera in manual, except for autofocus, and that's just because my eyes are getting so bad that uh, I need someone else to focus. I used to just manually focus everything and, and just put everything on manual. Um, but lately I've been using more and more of the technology in these cameras because it, it just helps. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, my, you know, my true love is more to do with, uh, composition, uh, the technical side of things I'm, you know, I'm pretty useless. So don't ask me any technical questions. Um, I do have a number of questions here, so I thought I'd go through some of them and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll answer some questions, uh, on the, uh, on the computer here as well. So my first question, and this was the first question that I got uh, in the community page, Mark Heslington, um, he asked, when you run workshops, how honest are you with participants when it comes to the standard of their work? 
Um, I'm not honest at all. I just uh, butter them up and tell them how great they are. <laughs> no. Um, and then he says, and secondly, what do you think the main reasons are for photographers to attend workshops? Well, I'll answer the second part first. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't actually been doing workshops for that long. Um, I set up my business for workshops, I guess it was four years ago. So the first year was a real flop. Um, and that's when I started up the YouTube channel because I, I just had a hard time getting uh, participants. And then the second year was really quite good uh, because of, of YouTube. And then, of course, the third and fourth year, well, we haven't been running workshops at all um, because of COVID. Um, it was funny because when I, the first workshops that I did, I had a whole plan and, and I was going to take people through a whole um, kind of set of things that I wanted to show them. But some people just turned off and, and actually some people just decided to go for a walk and, and do something else. Um, it could have been because I was just boring. Um, but what I'm, I'm finding is, is that a lot of people that come on the workshops that I've been doing anyway is primarily to hang out with other photographers. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there that'll have a spouse or friends that don't, they're not really into photography. So they just want to immerse themselves in photography. And that's probably one of the best ways to do it because you're basically with, with like-minded people and you're just spending a weekend or a whole week talking and, and immersing yourself in photography. And I think not everybody, but I think that's why a lot of people take photography workshops or go on tours. Um, when it comes to how honest I am with participants, um, I haven't really had a lot of opportunity to go through the whole, you know, you, you make the image, then you process it, and then we critique them. Um, most of the workshops I've done have been weekends, so you just don't have time to do that. Um, but I, I try to be honest. I mean, the thing is with critiquing is that you want to be honest, but you don't want to be so brutal that you put people off at the same time. I've noticed that that can kind of happen online. Um, people obviously have their own opinion about things. And when someone's just starting out and you're really brutal with them, then it, it kind of turns them off a little bit. So what I tend to do is try to find the, the things that I like about an image uh, and then I'll go into the things that perhaps I don't like or could be, you know, improved upon. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and then Dave McDonald, uh, he asked a question. Uh, do I have any thoughts regarding composition in chaotic scenes? I'd greatly appreciate your sharing uh, any things that come to mind. A lot of the stuff I've covered in my videos about chaotic scenes, especially woodland, I think the key for me anyway, is to go with an open mind, don't have any expectations, and then just look for very small specific scenes within the larger scene. Um, so if I see perhaps a piece of light that's, um, that's uh, hitting a specific tree or maybe um, a, a, a branch that's gnarly and, uh, and it's, it's different than the rest of the trees, then I'll concentrate on that and just try to um, just really simplify it and, com and, and just concentrate on that one element rather than trying to concentrate on the whole chaotic scene, if that makes sense. It's not that easy. Uh, it definitely isn't easy. And of course, the more chaotic a scene is, the, the harder it is. So it does take practice. And obviously, you know, I've been doing photography for a long time now. So like any profession, whether you're a plumber, electrician, or um, whatever, um, some of these things after a while become second nature. And um, so that certainly helps as time in the field. Um, let me just have a look in here. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, Thomas Hartman, what keeps you going after so many years? How do you maintain the interest in making art? What is your practice when it comes to feeling burnt out? Um, and how do I navigate myself back on track? Well, this is a prime example right now. And this usually happens to me every year. Um, I'm not really that inspired about photography right now. Um, 
partly because of the weather and just the light hasn't been great and it's the summer. Um, but I don't fret over it. I'll just go and do something else. I mean, luckily I have my van right now that I've been spending lots of time on. So that gives me another outlet. Um, sometimes it helps if you just do something totally different and, and not fuss about whether you're going to ever go back on track again, because eventually you will do. Um, I always look forward to the, the fall. Um, I have a trip planned uh, in a couple of weeks with my friend Jeremy. We're heading up to northern British Columbia, and we're flying into a location. Um, so I'm really excited about that and the possibilities. Um, and also uh, just the fall, I, I find, is my best time of year. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, will agree that fall and spring tend to be the best times for photography. Winter is, is good as well. Uh, especially if you get a lot of snow. So, um, yeah, I don't fuss over it too much. Um, it's just part of the creative process. I mean, I don't think anybody can be inspired all the time. You have to take a break and, and do other things, I think. Um, okay. Everybody can still hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, Adam, greetings from Australia. One of my questions is how far do you allow your edits to magnify the truth? Not speaking about sky replacement, but more about emphasizing the light, the fog, or, or whatever. Um, I, I, I go in phases, and I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, I think that, uh, well, that, that's one of the reasons why I show my, um, my raw files with my videos is so that you can get a little bit of an idea of, of how far I've gone with the editing process. Sometimes I don't do any editing. Um, I will just add a little bit of contrast, perhaps saturation, and that's it. And then other times I can see a little bit more potential. So I'll spend more time on it. I might do a lot more burning, uh, dodging. Um, and just a little bit in enhancement. Sometimes I will add um, uh, dehaze, except the other way, I'll haze it a little bit to add a little bit of atmospheric fog. Um, sometimes I'll add some Gaussian blur just to uh, make it look a bit more atmospheric. So I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I don't have a problem with manipulating images all out. I think it depends on what the context is and, and what you're trying to do with that photograph. Uh, unfortunately for, for me, when it comes to nature photography, um, I think I have a bit of a, um, I, I think I, I owe it to my audience. This is how I feel, is to show them how nature really is, right? Rather than trying to um, juice it up and, and make it look much better than it really is. Um, obviously, I, I do like really pretty scenes and I like uh, nice light and, and all that stuff. Um, but I'll only go so far with it. And then when it starts to get too much, when I start to manipulate, say, the mountains taller than they should be or um, putting elements in there that perhaps don't belong, then that's kind of where I draw the line because it wasn't really something that was there at the time. So I, I just I don't bother with it. Um, if I was going to manipulate my images like that, then why bother going out at all? You might as well just get a bunch of photographs from a stock agency and then just put them all together in Photoshop. So it's the actual process of, of taking the images that I really enjoy. And that's the part that um, really gets me excited, not so much the processing. Um, okay, John Drummond says, I know you used to shoot gardens for a living. Do you ever do macro flower photography even for practice, um, this time of year, flowers in botanical gardens are one of my favorite subjects. Um, yeah, well, actually, well, last couple of years I haven't, but I, I do, John. I, I really enjoy um, taking photographs of gardens. Uh, my video the other day of the the, of the van uh, conversion, I did a little bit of that in our, my own garden. Um, I keep meaning to go to one of the public gardens and uh, and take some photographs and, and perhaps this fall i might go to um uh, the, the gardens in victoria they have a, a beautiful uh Bouchard gardens had a, has a beautiful japanese section and the and the the fall color can be just absolutely uh, spectacular the only problem with Bouchard is the amount of people that 
will be there. Um, usually you get coach loads of people. So it's difficult to work with the subject when you have that many people uh, crowding around an area. Um, I used to have access to tons of different gardens, uh, private gardens, but of course I've lost touch with all those people. So I don't have that, that access anymore, but I went to some spectacular gardens, private gardens. And uh, yeah, I really do enjoy photographing uh, gardens. Um, I just haven't done it for a few years. Kind of go in phases, you know. Um, Marty D says, was there one person or group that has uh, influenced you uh, to want to start photography? Uh, he says, for me, it was my high school chemistry teacher. Um, there wasn't any really one person. Um, I've always been interested in the outdoors. And actually, the, the thing that really got me interested in the outdoors was the uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, when I lived in the UK, uh, we lived in central uh, England. So there wasn't an awful lot of mountains or areas to hike. It was pretty much a sub suburb of London. But um, I was very much in, uh, involved in the Scouts. And we had some amazing leaders. And of course, we went up to the Lake District quite often. And we went to Wales and the Peak District. And it was those leaders that really got me into the outdoors. Because my, my parents and my brothers aren't into the outdoors at all. And then eventually my older brother and I, we got into rock climbing and I joined the uh, Milton Keynes rock climbing club when I was uh, 13. And there was a guy there that used to take me out uh, up to the Peak District. Um, and when I think back, you know, I think, wow, this guy, you know, he's, he was in his twenties and he's taking this 13 year old out to go climbing. Um, so I was really, really lucky. And then from there, when I moved to Canada, um, obviously on, on my climbing trips, I used to take photographs. Uh, I thought I was Galen Rao, uh, but obviously I wasn't. Um, and then that kind of, eventually I, I got more and more into the photography part of it and less and less into the climbing. Um, the one person or the book that got me really into photography was a book by uh, a nature photographer named John Shaw, who's still around today. Uh, he had a book out back in the eighties um about nature photography and i was just blown away by the quality and how sharp his images were um so that kind of got the got the juices flowing and that's how i originally got into it and then it just kind of stemmed from there um hello everybody <laughs> uh next question valdir hobus i hope i'm pronouncing your name right Hello, Adam. I got your book this week. Thank you very much. Um, my question, what are your sources of inspiration? Any tips for composition? Okay, so this is kind of, uh, this is kind of along the line of the other question I got about chaotic forest photography. Um, the, the, yeah, I mean, the only tips I can really give you for chaotic scenes is just to practice, practice, practice. And if you see something out of the corner of your eye that attracts you, then try to think to yourself, okay, well, what is it about this object that I really like? And then from there, um, try to concentrate on those elements that you like and, and just add things that either add to the photograph or if, if it detracts from the photograph, then try to compose it so they're not in the frame. Um, Usually simpler is better, but of course, in chaotic scenes or forest scenes, that, that's not always that easy. Um, for those of you that, a lot of you probably already watch Simon Baxter's um, channel. Uh, Simon is amazing at composition in the forest. And um, in many ways, I think him and I kind of look for the same types of things rather than looking at say a tree as a tree, look at it as shapes and patterns and try to work it as, as a pattern and, uh, in your composition rather than, well, this is a tree or this is a leaf. Um, just try and look at the shapes that it's creating and then go from there. Uh, I know that Simon um, looks at trees uh, as characters and I'm sure that helps with his composition and how those characters interact with one another. Hi, everybody from Finland, Netherlands. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. 
Um, Danny Davili, um, recently started buying books and digging deeper into studying the classics. Not sure if you've talked about it in a video. Actually, I have. Um, I did a video some time ago about some of the books that I have. Um, I know that so there's a photographer on YouTube named Julian Baird. Um, he has uh, every now and then he he uh, does a, a review on books that he's purchased, and, and that's good to watch. Um, this kind of relates to what I was saying about John Shaw. Um, I would dig hearing who you find influential uh, um, and who you'd recommend checking out. Currently, I'm into Robert Adams, Fred Herzog, and Stephen Shaw. Um, anyways, thanks for the question and answers. Keep up the hard work. Um, there, are, there are a whole bunch of different photographers that I really enjoy. Um, one one photographer that comes straight to mind is Char Charlie Kramer, Charles Kramer. Um, most of the photographers that I was inspired by were from the 80s and 90s, uh, because that's when I started photography. And the large format photographers were my inspiration. Uh, Carl Clifton was another photographer. Uh, Patrick Morrow. They're all landscape photographers. Um, William Neal. Um, uh, I, Ansel Adams, I enjoyed his work when I first got into photography. Um, and then I got into more contemporary photographers. And of course, now if you go on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, there's a whole bunch of photographers that are, are really inspirational and doing different things. So um, I do still buy quite a few books. I, I really enjoy looking at books. There's, there's something about looking at an image on uh, in a book or in a print that I just find way more appealing than looking uh, on online. It's just a personal thing. So I have a huge collection of books. Um, the problem I have right now is is having a place to put them because <laughs> this this house I'm living in is quite small. It's uh, I think it's about 900 square feet. So I'm running out of room really quickly. Um, uh, Christina Schuster, hello Adam. The book and okay. Um, Okay, Christina talks about the, the zine, and I might as well do a plug of my zine. Um, I had 500 of uh, these printed by Kozu Books. Um, and what a zine is, is basically a cross between a magazine or a book. It's just a small portfolio of images. And I'm finding it to be a really great way to share my work. The thing about a zine is that especially lately, because postage has been so high, uh, sending books worldwide is, is just getting ridiculous. In some cases, the price of shipping costs more than the actual book. So I wanted to come up with something that I was able to sell at a reasonable price and also um, send without breaking the bank when it comes to postage. So it's a portfolio of 30 or so images. And this one happens to be from a trip that I took this past fall with my friend Jeremy uh, in the Canadian Rockies. We just had an, an amazing time. And uh, I think I, I've got some of the, the best images ever from that just that one trip. So I decided to just do this little portfolio. And uh, I got 500 of them printed. Um, I'll be able to uh, do perhaps one on um, uh, old growth forest, uh, forest photography, perhaps close up. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things you could you could do a zine on. And um, if any of you are into books, um, I highly recommend doing your own book. Um, when I first started uh, photography, I would um, get my images published in little books, like Blurb, I think Blurb, uh, a company called Blurb did one, or, or do uh, self-publishing. They are quite pricey. But it's a great way to pub publish your own work, especially if you're just showing it to family and friends. I I'd highly recommend it. Um, so if, if you are interested in one of these, um, there's a, I'll leave a link down below anyway. Um, so, sorry, Christina's question was, um, how do you manage with pictures that when viewed on, on the monitor, do not meet your expectations or that you do not like? Do you keep such photos, delete them, or do you assess them again at a later point in time? Um, 
most of the images I keep, I really need to delete a lot of the images. I think on my hard drives right now, I have probably about 80,000 images. Um, out of those 80,000, I probably have about two or 300 that I look at regularly. <laughs> so I really need to delete them. I go back to them. Uh, some of my older images, some of the old raw files, I'll try to rework them. Um, because, you know, as time goes on, I, I learn new techniques in Photoshop or Lightroom. And sometimes um, I can, you know, bring out the best out of a, a otherwise not so great image. And now and then I'll find gems that I, I really like that perhaps I, I didn't think of before. So I do keep them. Um, I mean, of course, there's times when um, I'll bring up an image on a monitor and it's not as good as what I thought it was going to be, but that's just part of the, the, the learning process and, and part of the creativity. Um, generally speaking, I don't actually shoot a lot of photos. Um, I'll usually find one or two compositions and then I'll just stick with that composition and just move in increments. And usually those increments, when you look at them side by side, they don't really make a huge difference. Um, but yeah, like if I go out, say this evening, I'd probably try one or two compositions and then just stick with them rather than try to run around taking tons of pictures. Um, John H. Pettigrew, Adam, uh, have you had issues with worming? Well, that's a bit personal. Um, oh, with Fujifilm. I shot Nikon for about 40 years and switched to Fujifilm a couple of years ago, but I see worming, especially on images with trees. I love the Fuji, but this puts me off. I'll be totally honest with you, John. I, if there is worming, I'm not seeing it. Um, I use Lightroom and Photoshop. I know that if you use Capture One, it's probably better for the Fuji uh, files. The reason why I'm not using Capture One is because I just didn't want to have to learn another program. It's taken me so long to learn Lightroom and Photoshop that I just stick with them. Um, I haven't noticed worming. If it is there, then I'm just not seeing it. Um, plus, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure what what magnification you're seeing this worming, but you've got to remember that if you're looking at a, a an image at 100%. Um, rarely, rarely are you going to blow it out that big where you're going to notice that kind of thing. Now, having said that, I know that a lot of people have complained about this worming, but I, I, I just can't see it. Um, so I must be missing something. I'm just seeing if anybody else has anybody else noticed worming on their in their Fuji files. I know that Capture One uh, addresses it really well, and Fuji kind of goes well with Capture One. Um, but yeah, I, sorry, I haven't, I just haven't noticed it that much. Lightroom's latest update had a deworm tool for Fuji sensors, cleans up everything and makes it normal like other Bayer sensor files. Yes. Uh, nice bike mate, uh, says XT4, I get worming in Lightroom. Okay. Um, Patrick says, nope, use the GFX 50R with Capture One, but no issues. Well, that, I mean, see, that's the other thing. Um, I am using um, a medium format camera, so maybe maybe it's different. Um, I'm using the GFX 100. Uh, I do have an X-T4, which I'm actually filming this with right now, but I just use it mostly for video. So that, that might be the reason why I can't see it. Maybe it just doesn't show up with that. Um, the, the GFX system. Uh, Patrick says he uses uh, the GFX 50R with Capture One, um, but no issues. Um, if you pixel pick, worming is definitely there on Fuji, but no real problem for me. So it seems to be some people notice it and some people don't. Um, Thanks for <laughs> clarifying the, the worming. I thought it was a... Anyway, um, okay. Now I have some other questions here. I don't know how long you guys want to. There's quite a few of you, few of you watching right now. So I guess as soon as the numbers start going down, then that, that's when I'll quit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when you're supposed to quit these things. Um, Jack Lego, any 
Any plans to ever come to Eastern Canada, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI? Also, any plans on making a road trip to with the guys? Um, yeah, I'd love to come to Newfoundland. Um, we just really haven't had much of an opportunity to travel. Um, I've pretty much just been stuck on the island for I don't know how long. I went to the Rockies uh, several weeks ago. I had a client, a uh, one-to-one, -one, and we went to the Rockies. Um, the light was not great, but we did manage to come away with some half-decent images. Um, but other than that, I haven't really left the island. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, there's places in the States I'd love to go to. Um, I do have a trip planned to uh, Scotland in November, I hopefully. Um, who knows? Um, my brother, my younger brother, he lives in Nova Scotia, not far from Peggy's Cove, which I've been to quite a few times. I mean, it's a beautiful province. Um, I've never been to New Brunswick. I have been to PEI. Newfoundland, I've never been to, um, but I'd love to go. So, yes, it's in the plans at some point. Uh, road trip two with the guys. Uh, I don't know. Um, we all seem to have our own um, kind of things going on. And, of course, with COVID, I mean, we were lucky to get the first trip in because it, it kind of – that's when COVID started, right just as we finished the uh, the road trip. And uh, we were in Las Vegas. And actually, I was supposed to be flying to China um, from Las Vegas. And of course, that's when that trip got canceled. And ever since then, we haven't, we've, we've talked about doing another kind of version, but I'm not sure that everybody's on board. Um, we will do something at some point, um, but I, I guess we're just waiting for when we can all travel again. Because, you know, part of the problem is, is that Tom is in the UK and then, uh, you know, Gavin, well, he's just down the road from me. But then Nick is in the States. So we're kind of spread out a little bit. So it's it's hard to, to get together and do anything. I'm sure we'll get together at some point. Um, let's see. Um, ben Crawford says, my question is, how do you plan to go away for landscape photography? Like what apps or website do you use? Um, <laughs> you'll probably be really surprised when I say I don't use anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty bad when it comes to organizing anything. Um, obviously, if I'm going to travel abroad, then I'll usually just look online and see what's in that area. Um, but locally, I... I've tried using some of these apps like photo pills and um, stuff like that, but I, I just can't get into them. I, I'm sure they're very helpful, um, but I, I just, I don't know. I, it's, I just like to show up to an area and just go and see what I can find. And that's, that's the fun part for me. Um, obviously, if you're gonna spend a whole bunch of money to go to say like Greenland, then uh, it would probably be helpful to at least find out what's there before you go. Um, and I, and I do do that to some degree, but, um, most of the local trips, I, I just go out and I mean, I'm really lucky on Vancouver Island because we have quite a few different areas that I can go to. So, uh, at a, all I have to do is look out the window and see what the weather's doing. And then I can decide from there where, where I want to go. So, um, I, I don't have to do an awful lot of planning. I'm going to, um, um, I have a nine-year-old Nikon D800, which has a lot of dust particles on the sensor that is hard to remove. Do you have experience in wet cleaning a sensor? I'm also curious as to how... Okay, well, the first part of the question... Um, yeah, I just get the swabs, and um, you can get them from any camera store. Um, just get the swabs, and you put the liquid on, and, you, and just follow the directions. It's... Um, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. A lot of the sensors have uh, a layer of glass in front of them. Um, unless you put grit in there or something, they, it's, it's pretty hard to scratch. If you're really worried about your sensor and you don't want to clean it, then I'd highly recommend just take it into a, um, a, a camera store um, to get it cleaned and someone will do it there for you. Um, I'm also curious as to how you focus a shot. Do you estimate hyperfocal distance? Um, I used to, 
Um, not anymore though. All I do is I'll just pick an area. I'll just focus on usually the most important part in the frame. And I'll just go from there and I'll, I'll just focus, uh, take the shot and then just look at the focus on the back of the screen. Um, and you know, if I have the, enough depth, then I'll stick with that. If I don't, then I'll stop down a little bit more. Or if I'm, you know, if my focal length is a little bit too long to get everything in sharp focus, then I'll do a bit of focus stacking. But generally I just focus on the most important thing in the frame. So um, say, you know, uh, my eyes are the most important part, then I'll focus on the eyes. Um, if it was the end of my nose, then I'll focus on the end of the nose. Um, I don't worry about that stuff too much because again, you know, obviously when you're looking at it at a hundred percent, then you're going to see things out of focus and some things in sharp focus. But when you make a print, you're, you're not going to notice it unless it's blown up massively. <clears throat> I think a lot of us um, tend to worry too much about the technicalities of a photograph. Um, I, I don't like to admit this, but I will, I will say it right now. When I was photographing gardens, which I did for 20 odd years, I shot everything at F22. <laughs> I just, I just left it at F22. The, the, the fraction was awful. Um, but the reason why I did that, I, cause I could just whip in there. I just leave it at F22 and not once in 20 years did I say someone say, oh, you've got way too much diffraction in your lens there. Um, because most of the time the, the images were blown up this big, eight by 10 at, at biggest. So I just, I was just more, I was just more concerned about depth than anything. And of course, back then we were using film, we couldn't do focus stacking or anything. So I just focused at, I just shot at F16 or F22 and that was it. Um, and I, I never really worried about it. And even now, um, I'll shoot a lot of my scenes at F16, especially with the, the larger format cameras. Um, F22, I rarely use um, because the diffraction is is pretty bad. Um, I don't like to admit that to people, but I did I did do that. <laughs> so, um, and that was the rest of your question here. Um, I find that if I manual focus through live view, I do a better job at getting the foreground and background sharp in the final image. Well, that's true. Um, if that's if that works for you, then you should stick with that. Um, you know, you, you might watch some video on YouTube and someone will say, well, you should do this. Well, it might not work for you. So if it doesn't, then stick with what you what works for you. Um, by the way, I also use F16 for depth of field and I'm aware of diffraction. Of course, um, you're going to get diffraction as soon as you stop down, depending on the lens and, and the construction of the lens. Um, like my large format camera, um, some of those lenses, uh, they have an f-stop of 64, f-90, and it wasn't unusual for me to stop down to f-45, um, f-64, um, and, but of course you're going to get diffraction, but um, sometimes when things are moving fast, it's just easier to get it all in one shot than try and fart around with, um, you know, uh, focus stacking. But I, I mean, I must admit, focus stacking is so easy to do now than that if you really want everything in, in sharp focus throughout the frame, then you'd be silly not to use it because it's so easy and automatic to do that um, uh, it takes you know two minutes to, to do it and two minutes to process the image. So, um, hi Adam, I wonder if Gavin, a Amanda's a really nice lady, I don't know. <laughs> Any comment on his book? Um, Gavin's book's really good. Um, I love the stories. Um, I would highly recommend it. It's it's a great book. Um, Gavin's a good photographer. I I have no um, <laughs> I have no other comments other than it's a good book. It is a good book. Not as good as mine, but it is a good book. <laughs> oh, that's it. All right. Well, I'm out of questions. <laughs> so this, uh, babe, this video is really blurry and, and stocked in frames every other second. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Astro doesn't really have a nice light. Oh, well, I'm sorry about the blurry video. <laughs> I guess because I had it on.
maybe if I try and see if I try manual focus, but oh, it's fine here. We got that weird circle. There we go. And then I'll I'll just turn that off. How's that? <laughs> Not in focus. How about how about now? Oh, maybe your computer's out of focus. Uh, when will your 2022 calendar be available for purchase? Good question. <laughs> Let's sell some stuff. Um, actually, back to the zine. I do have. Um, about 10 copies. So I might do a giveaway in the next little while. I've got to figure out how to do that. And um, I will be selling a couple of them, um, perhaps with a print or something. I didn't get that many because they're, they're being sent from the UK. Um, as far as the calendar goes, now last year's calendar uh, was this guy here. And for those of you that picked up a copy, um, I mean, I know it's my calendar, but the print quality quality was absolutely fantastic. Um, hats off to Kozu Books. The the problem with this calendar is that it was again expensive to produce and expensive to send. Um, I think Kozu were charging, I think it was 20, 24 pounds plus shipping. So that's a really expensive calendar. But what I'm doing this year is um this year the calendar is going to be this size but the same print quality again to try and keep the cost down a little bit um and also i'm i'm trying to work with uh photo speed paper in the uk and we might be supplying um everybody that purchases a calendar with um, an original print i'm not sure we haven't worked out the details yet but stay tuned for that if I do get calendars printed, I'll probably get um, about 500 printed. Um, the, the problem with all these printed goods right now is that all the photographers around the world, um, especially landscape nature photographers, are, are all scrambling trying to find ways to make money because workshops were canceled. And of course, everybody is coming out with books calendars, um, you name it, they're all these paper products. So the, the competition is, is pretty high right now. Um, but um, I will be producing a calendar and it should, hopefully an announcement will come out in the next little while. Oh, someone bought a calendar and uh, spilled coffee all over it. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. I'd say, I'll send you another one, but I've only got one. So, um, What some wankers hacked Gavin's account? <laughs> I have so uh, yeah. Victoria says I have so many calendars from the F four group. Yeah, you probably got one from Nick and uh, Tom and mine. I don't think Gavin came up. How did I meet Gavin and how did you meet photography friends before YouTube? Um, well, Gavin and I actually met in the Canadian Rockies. Um, I'd, I'd heard of Gavin and I'd seen his photographs, um, but we'd never actually met. And I, was, I had a client again and we were going to um, one of the little lakes there to take photographs. And as I was walking towards the lake, this guy came strutting up like this and it was Gavin, and I just happened to recognize him, and I, he just walked by me, and I said, hey, aren't you uh, Gavin Hardcastle? And we started chatting, and then we went out for a coffee, and at that time, Gavin was living in Calgary, and, um, and then eventually he moved back to Vancouver Island, and Gavin had done a few YouTube, um, uh, you know, YouTube videos, and, um, you know, I, I thought they were hilarious, so you know, we kind of encourage each other to, to keep going. And of course, Gavin is doing great videos now. I mean, I, I really enjoy going on Gavin's videos. It, it's great for me because I get to do two different types of thing, like my own channel, um, you know, it's a little bit more 
dry. It's not so, I don't put so much humor into it. Um, but it's great just goofing around with Gavin on some of his trips. And I think he comes up with some brilliant ideas. We kind of play off one another and come up with ideas. And then it just kind of escalates from there. And it's been a lot of fun. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but um, I think photography should be fun. Um, it shouldn't be so serious all the time. And it's just so much fun heading out with Gavin. We haven't been out a lot lately. Um, just because of the weather and the situation. Um, plus, I've been doing my van. But uh, I'm sure in the in the coming months, we'll probably go out and, and do some more stuff. <laughs> the perfect odd couple. <laughs> you need to gift Gavin a Fuji. Well, that's just Gavin being dramatic. Um, I, I told him he should have got a Fuji a long time ago, but you know, these guys with these Sony's. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Gavin's. I mean, he's done. He's doing something completely different, and um, it's like I said, it's just a, a lot of fun. Um, it's it's funny and and fun at the same time. So. Uh, Oh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. <laughs> John, I missed your answer to my flower photography question. Please quick recap. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> recap. Um, I forgot what I said now. Yes, I, I really do enjoy garden photography. I just haven't done it for the last couple of years. I'm not really sure why. I go in phases. Um, I used to do a lot of uh, macro photography and actually, one of the things that I really enjoyed, this was quite a few years ago now, um, a friend of mine who's since passed away, Fred Chapman, <clears throat> he got right into photographing frost patterns on glass. And um, I remember he, every morning in the winter, we'd go over to his house and he, on his greenhouse, he had all of these different frost patterns and um, so I kept going over and then there'd be three or four of us going over there. And then it got to the point where we started bringing out external lights and gels. And then at one point um, we'd see these beautiful patterns on the top of his greenhouse. So I asked Fred if I could start taking his greenhouse apart and we take the panes of glass out and then put them on um, saw horses and, and set them up. So we got the best light. And it was just, it was just a fantastic um, opportunity and we just got right into it. And ever since then, I, I haven't done any more of that. So I'd love to do more of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you just kind of go in phases. Like um, in the spring, I was right into the, the old growth forest because of, of what's going on um, in, our, in our forests. And um, I just really enjoyed it at that time. At that time because my, my videos started to get a little bit dull because I was <laughs> doing old growth forests every week. Um, but that, that's what I was enjoying at that time. And then lately I've been doing a little bit more uh, coastal stuff with the sandstone. So I'll, I'll tend to get into something and then concentrate on, on it for a little while. And then I'll kind of fall out of it and, and get, in, get into something else. And for me, that really keeps the, the nature photography uh, interesting. Um, I really take my hat off to people like Simon Baxter, who is just full on trees all the time. I mean, that for me, that would be really hard to do is just dedicate everything to that one subject. Um, I, I can see why he does it, um, but for me, that would that would be difficult. How do I pick which image to enter in a competition? Um, well, I only pick the ones that are going to win. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Um, I think the best thing to do for me, I've, I've entered a lot of contests in the past, and I've had good luck with them. Um, I'll look at past year's winners and I'll see what kind of quality, quality they are. And then I'll, you have to take a real honest um, look at your own photographs and even get other people to look at them and say, okay, I think this is a great photograph, but what do you think? And, and really, if someone critiques it, don't get angry at them if they say, well, I think it's rubbish. Um, 
just take a real hard, honest look at your own photography and say, is this at the same standard as what's been entered in the past? And if it is, is it different enough that it has a chance? If last year's winner was some fantastic shot of, say, I don't know, delicate arch, then why would you send another photograph of delicate arch, even though your light might be better? Um, if you if you've come up with something that's unique and that perhaps could only be never be repeated, then I think you have a chance. Um, I tend to, I mean, I've I've had good luck and I've had bad luck, and it also depends on the judges too. Um, because it's so subjective. And, and the thing is not to get angry about it, because we all look at winners of photo, of photo contests and go, oh, I got better images than those guys. Well, it's subjective, right? So you have to just go into it thinking, well, I'm probably not going to win, but if I do win, then it's a bonus. And um, I used to enter the Wildlife Photographer of the Year every year, even though I'm not a wildlife uh, photographer. Um, they had a category for uh, landscapes and I've and pattern shots and such, and I've of, often come. Um, I've never won, but I often got something in those categories. Unfortunately, the wildlife photographer of the year um, doesn't really have a landscape category anymore, and that's why uh, Alex Nail and Tim Parkin and those guys have come up with the natural landscape. Uh, photography awards uh, because it kind of follows the same guidelines as the wildlife photographer of the year except it's for landscape photography and i think um i don't have the address on me right here but i'm i'm pretty sure it's still open for um entry so if you're interested in that i'm one of the judges along with alistair ben tim parkin alex nail um sorry i've forgotten the other judges um oh joe cornish um, so it should be really good. Um, I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's the first of that type of contest where um, the processing has to take a little bit of a back seat. Um, and it's more about the quality of the the scene and the and the and the the image rather than what you can do in Photoshop. Anyway. Um, workshop in Scotland. Um, someone's asking about um, preparedness for a location that, um, I, I covered this a little bit earlier. Um, I'm not terribly organized, so I, I don't really prepare for trips unless it's somewhere abroad. Um, most of the trips I do, I just go with no expectations. I just go out with a camera and just start looking around. Alistair Who? Alistair Ben. Um, what would you suggest for shooting opportunities for people who most of the time live under blue skies? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, Astro. <laughs> I, yeah, it's that's a tough one. Um, I've I've really been struggling. Um, and Vancouver Island, I mean, most summers we do get a little bit of warm weather, but this year has just been exceptional. Um, we've had weeks and weeks of sunshine and hot weather, and the light is not terribly great. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that one. If anybody has an answer for that one. Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, I'd love to go to the Appalachians. We need more quality photo contests alongside Wildlife Photographer of the Year because it is one dimensional. Well, that, that's the hope with this contest. I mean, it's the first year, so I'm sure there'll be some growing pains with it. Um, obviously, there has to be some kind of processing. Um, we can't just I mean, all of my images are processed, um, you know, so you, you can't really get away with it. But but I, I tend to agree, um, and it's not a negative um, stance, but most of the contests, even the, the International Landscape Photographer of the Year, I've noticed that 
Um, many of the images are very much digitally enhanced. Um, I know that in the uh, Pano Awards, the Epson Pano Awards, um, very digital, um, heavy handed with the digital side. And, and, and that's, I don't have a problem with it. Um, but it, I don't know, for me, it kind of takes away from the art of actual going out and taking photographs, like looking for great light and and looking for great composition. For me, that's the enjoyment in photography is those moments when you capture that light or that moment rather than creating it later in a program. But some people like to do that, so that's fine too. Um, what are my thoughts on cropping? Do you shoot a scene? With the intention to crop in post-processing, do you stick to the common crop formats or unconstrained crops too? Um, well, lately with the uh, the GFX system that I've been using, I use the crop feature inside the camera an awful lot because we have so many megapixels. I've been doing a lot of panos lately. Um, I think I'm just going through a phase um, yeah, I crop crop my images a lot, and I, I don't always use the given formats like four by five, four by three. Although I do tend to stick to those formats, um, but there are times when um, I'll I'll just make up my own format because it fits fits the image. I mean, ideally for me, I, I mean, if I can compose an image um, in the uh, native format of that camera. Um, then obviously you're going to get the full maximum resolution and so on from the sensor. Um, but I wouldn't use that as a basis to, you know, shoot all my images at, at that format just so I get, um, you know, the, the best quality. Um, like I said, that I really, I've been really enjoying the, the crop feature in the GFX system. And most cameras have that now. It's just that I just started using it in the GFX just because this, there's so many megapixels. So I, I just feel that I'm not really losing anything by cropping it. Um, how about a trip to Norway? Yeah, I've never been to Norway. I mean, there's lots of places I'd love to go. Um, it's Most of it is time and obviously money. And also um, with travel, um, I think with, with not many people traveling uh, so often, um, you kind of think to yourself, well, is my travel really that necessary? I mean, we seem to be facing a little bit of a crisis here with the environment. And, um, you know, maybe it's time to question uh, 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 why why are we traveling? Um, I don't know. It's, it's a tough one. I mean, I have a trip to um, Antarctica, supposedly in February. And I remember some people commented about, well, you know, you shouldn't really be going down there because you're not, you know, you're, you're causing pollution and, and all kinds of things like that. And I, and at the time I, I kind of got angry and said, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, you're, you're creating pollution. Um, but now I'm kind of second thought, I'm sec second guessing my, my trip plans. I think, well, is it really necessary? I mean, I'd love to go to these places, but um, am I really adding anything to the photo community by, going to these places and videotaping them. Um, I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I must visit India. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to visit India. Oh, what are my thoughts on NFTs? Um, well, that's, <laughs> that's uh, we're going to open up a whole can of worms here. Um, I've been looking into NFTs, actually, um, and I know that a few photographers have started selling NFTs. Um, I don't really, I don't, I'm still trying to grasp what they are and, and how they, um, you know, how, how they uh, produced and so on. I know that um, a few of my friends have started selling NFTs. The big problem with NFTs is that my understanding is that they use a huge amount of energy to produce. And I mean, not just a little bit, but a huge amount. Now, I, I know Gavin, Gavin sent me a couple of articles uh, that um, were more on the positive side. And then, of course, there's articles about how much energy they use. Um, 
I think at this point, personally, I'm probably not going to get into the NFTs um, just because of the energy use. I think at some point they will find another way to do it that doesn't use so much energy. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea for artists um, because finally artists are able to make money. Um, and let's face it, there are a lot of starving artists out there, um, including photographers. Uh, believe it or not, just because I'm a YouTuber doesn't mean to say I make a ton of money. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, if you want to do this for a living, then you do have to make money. And if, if you start traveling, then you have to make more money. But then you have to kind of question yourself, well, how much money do I actually need? Um, do I want to be rich um, or do I want to make just enough to make a living and get by? Um, but the NFTs, I don't know, it's, it's still up in the air. Um, I know some people are dead against them. And I've seen a couple of posts on Instagram, Instagram, people getting really upset about photographers using, uh, or selling NFTs. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know uh, there was one guy got upset for uh, Tom for selling NFTs. I, I don't think that was really fair. Um, anyway, um, yeah, for now, I think I'm just going to leave it and and see where it progresses. And, and hopefully um, th they find a way to create them without using, <laughs> you know, burning um, uh, trucks and truckloads of coal to produce them. Um, video is cutting out for a few seconds every five minutes. Yeah, I think it's my camera. I, anyway. Yeah, sorry, NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Um, I still haven't wrapped my head around them because they're, they're a little weird. Um, personally, I, I would rather have a, a print, but um, never fart twice. No, uh, non-fungible tokens. It's a digital, it's a, di it's, a, it's, a, it's a digital rendition of your art, but it's made so that whoever you sell it to actually owns that image outright. Um, it's kind of a weird concept and I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. Um, but once they buy it, they own it. Uh, they own that. It could be anything, it could be music, could be um, a, a video file, a GIF. Um, it could be anything. Um, it's just, a, it's a weird thing to wrap your head around, but you just look it up, it's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, Larry says, call me old school. I'd rather have a traditional print hanging on my wall. Uh, I agree, Larry. Um, but if you go on Instagram, there are some places that sell NFTs and most of them are little digital files or digital art. And actually some of them are, are really cool um, to watch. So I don't know, maybe it's a great way to sell that kind of art. Um, Someone says, if you have a chance to go to Antarctica, um, you definitely need to, since many people won't have the chance, once in a lifetime chances waste. I agree, but, uh, but I have been. I've been to Antarctica. I've been to South Georgia Island and uh, the, uh, the Falkland Islands. I, I went about eight or nine years ago. So I have been, and it's an absolutely incredible, incredible uh, location. Um, South Georgia Island is just, just mind-blowing um the wildlife there the the wilderness and and the location of that island is just unbelievable um but it is a long way um and you have to the only way to get there is by boat or fly i think so it does you know it does take a lot of money and uh a lot of energy to get there Hello from Northern Ireland. Hello. Are my overseas trips sponsored? Uh, no, uh, they're not. Um, most of them are workshop related. So that's how I end up going there. Um, like this trip to Scotland this fall, um, I'm doing a workshop with Alistair Ben, but I'm also going for a personal trip with my friend Paul. Um, Paul and I are going away for a week in his camper. And then at the end of that week, um, 
uh, I have the workshop with Alistair. So that's how I'm able to kind of mix them up as trips. If you sell an NFT, can the buyer reproduce the image and sell prints from it? Uh, you know what, John, I, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know how all that works. Um, I'm guessing they can. They can. I think what happens is someone will buy an NFT and then they a lot of investors are buying them. And then if they sell them again, then the artist gets 10% of what they've sold them for. So you continually make money off, off of that image. That's my understanding anyway. Um, I know some photographers have done really well out of them. Um, but some of the NFTs are selling for just absolutely incredible amounts of money. Um, I guess it's some ways, uh, some uh, a different way of investing for some people. I'm not sure. It's it's kind of a weird concept, but be careful if you got Ben Nevis. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I think I think that might be it. Um, I'm running out of things to say. Um, but thank you ever so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you'd like me to do this again, leave a comment down below and I'll perhaps do this again sometime. It's kind of fun to chat with people online um, and I'll try and figure out the technical issues with the with the camera, um, gotta figure it out. But anyway, thanks so much. And hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I'll have a regular video for you guys again. Um, like I said, it's just hard to, you know, to get motivated and, uh, and get out there. But um, I'm really looking forward to this trip with Jeremy. Um, and hopefully we'll have some great footage from that area as well. All right. So don't forget, if you're interested in my, um, my stuff, uh, check out my, my book quiet light and uh, the zine and the calendar is coming out. So keep an eye out for those. Have, oh, someone says, have you thought about having a shop or gallery in Victoria? Um, at one time, I think it's every photographer's dream to have a gallery, but realistically think about it. You have a gallery. So once you open up a gallery, um, you're going to be spending all your time in that gallery unless you can hire people to to work it for you. So you have to make enough money in that gallery to keep the place open and pay employees. Plus, you'd probably have to have it in a location that is very popular with tourists like Victoria, which means that the leases or the rents are going to be very high. Um, so um, at one time, yes, I, I would have loved to have a gallery, but after kind of dabbling in the art shows and that a little bit, it's just not for me. I, I know people do make money out of, or make a living out of art shows. Um, I did a couple, um, and actually I still have one in, uh, in Vancouver for next year, but they're very expensive to enter. Um, I did one in New York three or four years ago. Um, and it was several thousand dollars just to have my, my photographs hanging. In, in, in New York. Um, plus we went out there um, and uh, you have to sell your work at very high prices and you have to sell a lot of it to make a go of it. And I just wasn't prepared to spend all my time fussing over trying to sell prints. I would, I would rather be outside and, um, and, and take photographs and do YouTube and, and stuff like that. Now and then I might do the odd gallery, but um, yeah, it's, I don't think it's for me. All right, everybody. Thanks ever so much. I'm going to stop the video now. I've got to figure out how to stop this. <laughs> All right. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Bye, everybody.